The Diary of a Harlequin is proudly brought to you by Charles Stanley Wealth Managers, official player welfare partner of Harlequins. If you're looking to start your investment journey, then Charles Stanley has lots of tips and ideas on how to secure your financial future. Welcome to the Diary of a Harlequin. I'm your host, Joe Yates Round, and today we're speaking to Harlequins winger Caden Murley. Caden has come through the ranks at Harlequins and follows in his father's footsteps in playing in the famous quarters. With his father having a military background, Caden brings that discipline and uncompromising nature to his play. Not just a great scorer of tries, but a scorer of great tries. He's been knocking at the door of England for some time now. The current Supporters Player of the Year, Players Player of the Season, and overall Men's Player of the Season, his reputation is only growing. Welcome to the Diary of a Harlequin, Caden Murley. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, look, heard in that introduction about the many, many accolades that are currently around your shoulders uh, when it comes to Quinns. I mean, you must feel the love quite a lot from this place at the moment. Supporters, other players, the coaches. Are you just really enjoying your time in the quarters at the moment? Yeah, massively. I mean, coming back into the environment after doing a bit of an in- with England, it was, yeah, again, we're on for a very special season, I believe. Yeah. Buzz around the place is brilliant. But yeah, I, I love being in this place, being around being around the fans, being around the boys, being around the staff. It's just, it's a great honour to always pull on this, this um, Harlequin's jersey. And yeah, and it's great to be around. And look, we'll, we'll come on to kind of that England experience mm-hmm. with, with being in the camp. But before we kind of go back and look at your rugby career and career kind of from the start, what was the biggest difference for you coming out of that international environment and back into this Quinn's environment? I think for me, it was one of the first times I've, <clears throat> I've been away from the Quinn's environment, I've been in it, I was in it six years before going into the England stuff. So to just experience a new way of firstly playing. Mm. So the rugby side of things, playing, learning off different players who obviously play in different styles in their teams um, and almost being the rookie again, coming in yeah. into a new environment and trying to look, figure out what's what and how to do all of that. Um, rather than I like to see myself as a bit of a leader here. So that kind of dynamic was very different, which I enjoyed. Um, mm. And yeah, but then, like I said, I've enjoyed coming back and hopefully having a bit of an impact in a different way back at Quinn's, being a bit more of that leader. Nice. So right, <clears throat> as we get to the end state of where you're at now in terms of Caden, the leader uh, mm-hmm. at Quinn's, where you want to get to, let's kind of go back. We mentioned the introduction. Your dad played here um, at the Stoop. So from a very early age, was it always rugby? Was he like, right, you are going to be a rugby player? Was that your ambition? Yeah. How does that sort of No, out? so... My mum and my dad had a chat and it had to be what I wanted. Mm. So although they did actually set up a rugby club for me out in Germany because there was no rugby club, wow. lived on a big military camp out there and there was no rugby club. Um, there was only a football club. So my mum was a secretary, my dad was coaching and he got all these other dads involved. And although they did set up a rugby club, I did play both. Yeah. And I remember it got to a point, I think I was about nine or 10 and I had to choose which way to go. And it was a very close decision between football and rugby, but... Um, luckily, I think for my dad's sanity, uh, I went down the rugby route and yeah, haven't looked back. So what was that like then as a, as a kid in Germany? Did you go to a German school? Or was it kind of all really contained in the military base? Like, it must have been a kind of very different childhood to maybe many of your peers here at Quinn's and kind of just generally. Yeah, so it was all on a big military base, a lot of uh, British, a lot of Americans. Um, and yeah, we all went to the same primary school, but because you're on this big military camp or protected by security etc it gave you great freedom to just yeah. go out and knock on a door and go to the park with your mates and kicking balls around i remember um so yeah i've got very fond memories of being over there but yeah my biggest regret is i wish i had done some german letters when i was younger <laughs> or something because you pick up so much easier when you're younger now i look i remember i started doing it for gcse and i couldn't get my head around it and i wish i had done that when i was younger oh that's that's quite funny i was gonna say how was your german but non-existent non-existent yeah <laughs> um and so that when did you then how long were you in germany for before you came until back to i think it was until the age of about eight oh, and then right, i moved okay. to cornwall yeah um because that's where my parents are originally from down in penzance right right at the end of the world <laughs> um so yeah and then spent primary school down there and then moved up for secondary school to Salisbury, and that's where I ended up for secondary school. Right, okay. So what was that, I mean, casting your mind back to being, I guess, eight years old, mm. but that must have been quite a big upheaval going from that life in Germany, kind of really contained everything in kind of one yeah. place, to then coming <clears throat> back to the UK and then Penzance mm-hmm. and, and Cornwall. Did you find that a strange adjustment, adjustment for you at that age? Yeah, see, I think when you're, again, when you're younger, you just 
going heads first. I yeah. think you don't look back, you don't worry about making new friends or anything. You're straight in, aren't you? And you're playing games. So I think that ha has helped me. I think mm. adapting to change and when things do change. And here at Quinn's, we seem to have, have a, had a bit of a change since I've come in with the coaching and the way yeah. things are done. So I think it makes me very adaptable. And I think that's one of the things that I would say is one of my skills. And so your dad had set up this, your mum and dad had set up this rugby mm. club for you on the, on the military base. When you were then back in the UK, were you finding a local club down there in, in Cornwall to kind of keep that, that rugby bug going? Then? Yeah, definitely. So I played for the Weybridge Camels down in Cornwall. Um, shout out to the Camels. Yeah, shout yeah. out to the Camels. Um, but my dad always managed to get himself into a head coach role. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. From the age of three when they set up the rugby club for me until the age of 18, even at school, he became friends with the coach. So then he became our forwards coach, who was always my coach from the age of three <laughs> to the age of 18. So wow, I guess he taught me a lot and I guess he yeah. taught me relatively well. Well, I think, you know, fair play because you, yeah. you are sat here. Although he was a flanker, so... Right. Yeah. So, uh, and I was a flanker until I was 16. How does he feel having a back for a son now? Does it feel like um, you betrayed him? Did you have to tell him, you're like, Dad, <laughs> I'm a back? No, I think he saw it in me. I think I was, oh, I'm a lot smaller than him and I'm a bit quicker. So, yeah, I think it was always right that I was going to end up in the backs. What was that relationship like then with your dad? Obviously, I imagine you guys are still very close and must mm. have been super close given you're spending all that time <laughs> together. But sometimes the role of dad and the role of head coach, you have to have different conversations did it ever spill over into the dinner table at home with your mum going can we just not talk about rugby um no not really he was actually pretty good but he'd always say he'd have 30 kids say listening to him yeah. there would be one kid at the back who did doesn't listen it would be me just because i've heard it all before i think it'd be one of those yeah. so he was obviously like you said he was military he big onto his speeches from napoleon all the boys would be like wow <laughs> and i'd be like oh god and you're not, like, not again, again. Yeah, yeah exactly so but no i think he enjoyed it and we had a good relationship so and we always were pretty successful as as youngsters yeah so so you then kind of gone through that primary your dad's coaching you then at secondary he's managed mm. to worm his way in <laughs> yeah. so he's head coach there now as well at what point kind of in that it's probably more a secondary school sort of age you start mm. thinking about could this be a career? Was that ever something that you were like tunnel vision on or were you trying to keep your options open at that stage? No, not at all. I mean, I wasn't in any sort of academy or county until mm -hmm. I think it was right at the end of the under 16, going into the under 17 season. So going into sick form, I, the county coach, I'll never remember this, he sat me down. It was one of those trial days and you have your numbers and you call out your number and go over yeah. and he was like, just don't think it'll be for you. You're too small. You know, I was a flanker at this stage. You're yeah. too small. You're never going to make it. And then, a lot of boys, I remember a lot of boys fell out of love for the game because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just shows how much like one person's opinion doesn't yeah. have to shape the rest of your career. And luckily I got a trial here at Quinn's and have never looked back from there. But yeah, I remember that that one conversation sticks out with me a lot. I imagine he's kicking himself slightly now, um, watching you become premiership <laughs> top try scorer last season. But at the same time, do you think that that rejection, to call it that, mm -hmm kind of crystallised that this is what you really wanted to do at that age, that you weren't one of those guys that went, ah, oh, well, had a good run, but maybe yeah. I'll try something else. That you're like, no, they've still got a fire in me. Yeah, I think it almost drove me to want to be like, I want to do this yeah. almost to spite you in a way. <laughs> <laughs> That's just my person. I want, I'm so stubborn. I want to prove people <laughs> right. wrong. So, um, yeah, it definitely uh, drove me and want, made me want to try and pursue it as a career, definitely. But even still, I was applying to unis. I wasn't sure yeah. if I was going to get contract here at Quinn's and luckily I did and signed a two-year coming out of school and yeah started playing in my second year so yeah it was a, it was a good little run those first couple of years out of school I can imagine and I imagine quite quite liberated to just be doing rugby mm -hmm. like having been at school obviously it's a big big jump up yeah. at what point then when you know as a flanker too small mm -hmm. was that at Quinn's that you started to become this winger and, and, and so this at Quinn's I was a Sent, I, I trialed as a centre right? because I'd always thought, oh, maybe maybe I'm not going to be a flanker. I yeah. hadn't grown quite as much as I thought I would. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I went as a, in as, as a centre, signed in my first year as a, as a 12, really. Right, okay. I was playing 12 down at Isha on loan most of the time. So, And then all of a sudden, it was it was actually Paul Gustard who said, you show some qualities, you'd be a good wing. And they had a few injuries and went from, from there and have literally never looked back. So I'd still like to give a bit of 13 ago and I would but <laughs> the quality of 13 we got here at Quinn's I can't really see my way in but yeah I'm still enjoying my time on the wing nice because I, <clears throat> I remember I think it was it was it Worcester away mm -hmm. when you made one of your very yeah. very early appearances on the wing and you suddenly I remember watching it and going blimey this this young lad is 
pretty sturdy mm -hmm. because I think it'd be easy to look as a young guy coming through the academy, make, make a start on the wing and go, oh, way at Worcester under the lights, mm -hmm. ah, he's going to get run over here. What was that experience like for you? Like having had those knockbacks, always wanted to pursue it and suddenly you get that chance, you're playing on the biggest stage. Were there any nerves or like tension or, yeah? Yeah, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't really get that nervous, I wouldn't say. But yeah, that first game, that first Prem game, Worcester away, the final yeah. was massive. That was definitely the most nervous I've ever been for a game. So they're the two that really stick out in terms of that. But we were quite lucky in our year in the sense that we had Marcus in our year. <laughs> Honestly, like the year before, I remember boys saying, oh, they're not really integrating into training. The first years were kind of on the side, but obviously he went in, started that first game of the season. So they were like, oh, maybe this year is quite good because we won the under-18 premiership as well. Of course, yeah. So we kind of got chucked in at the deep end. So, and that's another one, actually. The first tra ever training session with Quinns was a nervous one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting thrown at the deep end and just taught how to do it that way. And I think some of the qualities from being a flanker, I think that's where I differ from some people who mm. probably have stayed on the wing all their life. I like to say I'm a bit more physical than than most wingers out there and the breakdown kind of work I actually quite relish and quite enjoy. Yeah. So it's a bit, you don't hear usually hear many wingers saying that. So yeah, <laughs> I think I just wanted to prove my, to myself that I could do it and prove to everyone else and try and like make, make my mum and dad proud. Yeah, and, and you kind of, there's a few bits that you mentioned that I'll come back to you, but one being that, under 18s uh kind of win with you marcus like a really exciting crop of of, of young guys what was that first training session like you can't kind of imagine coming into that on the back of a massive high like mm -hmm. we've done it we're current champions we're mm -hmm. getting our chance in with the in with the big boys now mm -hmm. was there that real knot in the pit of the stomach when you walked in and you're seeing some of these guys like your know, rob shaw's mike yeah. brown danny cares you're like oh these yeah. are these are the big names yeah definitely <laughs> it was yeah, to get chucked in straight away. I think we almost thought we'd be gradually introduced, but because there were quite a few internationals and stuff away, I think that actually helped. So the first training session, I think all the England boys had been on a tour or something. So all the massive names weren't there and we were needed for training almost. So we got yeah. built in and then, but yeah, I remember them coming back and being like, oh my gosh, these are people I've watched on the TV for the last five, 10 years and wanted to be like, and yeah. now I'm training with them. Yeah, it was pretty special. What's what's that training environment like at Quinns with the young guys? When you're one of the young guys coming through, is there a bit of the older boys, the more senior boys, getting at you wanting to test your method a little bit, or is it quite a welcoming? Or has it changed even since in the time that you've been here? Um, I wouldn't say it's changed. I feel different groups stick together. So the back three, Ross Chisholm was always someone who was massively helpful for me at a young age. He would go through games. He would talk me through things. We also had Tommy Williams, who has recently gone into the transition coach role yeah. as a back three. So we had a lot of guidance as that in that kind of back three role. Um, so yeah, it, it made it a lot easier to have those kind of people around you. I think I remember the first session with Brownie. I think I made a mistake and <laughs> I didn't make that mistake again for a couple of months <laughs> because yeah, he's, he's on your back and he's, that's just his competitive nature. But yeah, it was definitely the intensity was something I'll, I'll always remember of that first session. And are you yourself quite an intense person, do you think, when you're, when you're on the pitch and when you're training? Or you said you don't get massively nervous. Does mm -hmm. that translate into how you kind of are around, around the place, that you're more relaxed and laid back? Yeah, definitely. I think I can get pretty almost hot-headed and have a bit of a temper on the pitch. But, right. that, but most of the time, yeah, I'd say I like to say I'm relatively chilled out, can have those conversations with people in a pretty um, well-mannered way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are occasions where... I'll lose my temper, but Quinn's is always an environment where everyone's, if you need to, if a young first year comes in and needs to train on the wing, everyone gets around him and sorts of rally, rallies around him. They don't want to just chuck him out there and see how he does almost. It's not like that, but um, yeah, it's always a good environment to be in. Okay. And then, so that was the one time you got nervous. He talks about the, the debut and then the, the Prem final. I mean, mm -hmm. that was just a mad, <clears throat> a mad six month period almost with the change in coaching. We've talked about with a few of the guys that are coming. We had mm -hmm. Steph, um, on the pod and Lewis as well talked about, about it from his point of view. There was obviously such a change in what happened off the pitch that then translated to on the pitch and then suddenly you know, that comeback win against mm -hmm. Bristol. What was the belief like in the group waking up on that final morning, walking over to Twickenham, like, yeah, it wasn't 80,000, it was 10,000. Was there a, a crackle in <clears throat> energy? I mean, it's probably easy to look back now and say, oh, we all knew we were going to win, but what did it feel like to be a part of it? So it was actually probably even weirder so I injured myself. I was out for about 10 weeks. That's when Lewis and Tyrone were at the wings and were carving yes, up. Yeah. I then came back for a couple of weeks and then blew my ankle again. So I was out for another four weeks. So I actually only played in that 
run to the final, I think three games yeah. to it. And then I played the Newcastle game off the bench, trying to get minutes for the semi-final. Didn't play the semi-final. And then Aaron Morris did his Achilles in the semi-final. And I remember I walked into the building the first training day after that Bristol, the week of the final. And I look at Danny Kerr and he just winks at me and goes, it's a weird sport, rugby. One week you're out, the next week you're in for a final. And I was like, oh, is he playing with me? Is he joking? What's going on? Because I still didn't know the team. Obviously, I hadn't been involved. Yeah. I was traveling reserve for the semi-final. And that's when heart rate started to go up. And then, yeah, Billy Millard grabbed me. He was like, you're in. And that was when it all really started to kick in. I'd only played three games in about six months. Yeah. So that was when I was like, right, I need to be on it this week. The boys had done a 100-minute game at Bristol, so they are all knackered. But I wanted to get enough in, so I felt good in myself. So I was there doing extra fitness on the Monday, trying, trying to just make myself feel that I was ready for this game. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, slightly different for me, but I'd say after we won that semi-final, yeah. the belief all that week was we're going to do it now. Brilliant. I think, I'll never forget, walk, then, we're then walking in the tunnel at halftime at Bristol when Dom was had just scored. Yeah. And as a travel reserve, you kind of look down on the tunnel as they walk in. And I remember just catching eyes with Marcus and he's like, that was, we needed that. That's the turn. Right. Then ever from then, you could see the second half. There was no doubt we were going to lose that. No. No doubt. And then, wow. So <clears throat> you just, you told that story about Danny winking at you and said it's mm -hmm. a funny old sport. And I just got a little shot of adrenaline. I was like, am I playing a <laughs> final? I'm not playing a final. Like <clears throat> to then have that high of the adrenaline and then the realisation, but it's still a long lead in that week. Like knowing that that's the last game of a season, there's, you don't need to worry about your recovery for the week after because mm -hmm. whatever happens you're on a yeah. you're on a break is that the most intense week or actually a lot of boys trying to save themselves to make sure they've got enough in the tank for an 80 minutes on the saturday what does that look like so i imagine there's a few boys not wanting to want to pick up an injury in training mm -hmm. on the week of the final or do you need to play at 110 percent to make sure you're sharp enough like how do you balance that well, that was that was and because the boys have just played 100 minutes yeah. they were all knackered so yeah. sore they just wanted to like you said rest their bodies get ready so they're fully 100 percent ready to go whereas i was the other way, I was like, I need to get something in. I need to make myself feel better about this, make it a normal week for me so I'm ready. So there was a bit of difference in the balance. And yeah, you had boys, I don't think, who trained until the Thursday on that week before wow. the final. And then obviously we rocked up and did what we did at Twickenham. But that walkover was always something special as well. Yeah, Walking over and I think I, can't, I think it might have been March who just put his arm around me and being like, this is it, like kind of thing. And I was like, wow, this is it. Premiership Shh. final. I think I can't remember how old I was, 20 or 21. It was, yeah, it was quite something. But yeah, and to go out and do it how we did it in the Quinn's way was made it even more special. And you look back, that was a really <clears throat> young group, actually. Like, there was some experienced heads in there, mm -hmm. but across the back three, you know, all the way through the squad, there were some young players kind of mm -hmm. arriving on this stage very early on yeah. in, their, in their career. How do you come back from that? You know, like next season, season after, like you've, you've reached that pinnacle in, in the premiership. Like, is having players like Danny, who obviously won one and then had to wait a long time mm -hmm. for that second one, are they the sort of voices you really want to hear when you're a young guy that's achieved that's going to keep you grounded? Yeah, definitely. He was always saying, and I think because we did it so young, he almost he was brilliant at trying to keep us grounded. Yeah. I think because he almost did the same back in 2012 and then they went on that, obviously, run where they didn't win much for a while. So, yeah, he was definitely someone who would speak a lot during that mm -hmm. next season when we got to the semis and try and rally us and say you want we want this feeling every year remember how good that felt after the final and it was a hell of a feeling so <laughs> we wanted to try and emulate that emulate that again and to have yeah the experience for him marla yeah all around us was was really kept us kept our feet on the ground and then you mentioned him a couple of times already but like marcus is a really good mate of yours mm -hmm. you guys are, have been very close kind of coming along the same journey together albeit at slightly different speeds mm -hmm. because not everyone's a Marcus and yeah. gets catapulted into the first team mm -hmm. at, at, at age 18. What's, has he changed? Is he different? Is he the same Marcus that you played with when you were 16, 17, 18 to, to now? Or has he kind of changed, evolved his style as a, a leader on the pitch? I think he's changed, evolved his style of leadership. Right. He's the same, he's the same kid he was at 16, <laughs> losing his temper when things don't go wrong. He's a, he's a perfectionist. He, right but he also can't switch off he, his drive and his want to get better and his his analysis off the pitch is just mm. incredible. Like I remember I lived with him for four years and yeah. there'd be times when it would be, we'd get him from watching the game or from playing the game, sorry, get back straight to the house and within two, two minutes he'd have the TV on, going through it on BT Sport forward, 
like fast forwarding, rewinding, going back to this, talking through it. It's just his appetite to want to win and get better is just something like I've never seen. And that definitely inspired me to want to do it as well, especially when I wasn't playing in those first that first year or two. I wanted to join him and be and now we're at that level together. It's it's every time I get on the pitch I I have that little smile with him. We're like, yeah, we're ready to go. We're gonna do this. Nice. And how would you put yourself on on that scale as someone who you lives and dies uh, by by rugby wants to watch consume it all hours of every day or are you someone that wants to have when you're in rugby you're yeah. in rugby but also when you're out of it you've got other stuff going on yeah i would say that to me when i'm i often find myself staying quite late in the building or, or coming in quite early if i want to do more i don't right. i don't really like taking it home too much right but when i'm in the building i'm on um i have my plan i like to have a structure of the day right okay um i like to know what i'm doing i don't really like things changing too much from that but yeah i like to know what i'm doing in the gym know what i'm doing pretty early doors and then i'm happy to get on with my day and then when you're not in the building then so when mm. you're when you're switching off what's what's caden merley like away from quinn's in his in, in his own time in your own space i like to socialize quite yeah. a lot i think especially because i've just moved into a place on my own i like to try and get out the house as much as i can go for coffees try and meet the boys yeah. i'm big on my cards i like playing my cards okay um hosted a couple of poker evenings recently just trying to get the boys into that just it's just such a good social thing to do yeah and little things like that i just enjoy going out for food that kind of thing nice and so would you say that you're kind of more extroverted in that sense that being around people gives you that that energy to keep going rather than i don't know rather than needing that insular time away we're like all right i want to just stay at home headphones in shut off from the world like you want to be out there feeling it experiencing yeah definitely it. i like yeah, I'd say I'm a big people person. I like being out there and put myself into a group and, um, yeah, get myself out there that way. But there are times where I do just want to be on my own and I do yeah. have that sense where I just need to... Um, I've got quite a good routine. I go through most mornings of, like, my stretching and stuff and I think that's enough time for me to be on my own. Right, okay. And then, yeah, when I'm out in the building or going out for coffees and stuff, that's when I like to socialise. So who's the who's the best poker player in the group? Well, we're actually only just building into it, but George Head did wipe us of a... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, which was quite frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> and who's, who's got the worst poker face? Who can you spot? Nick um, David. <laughs> Nick David. <laughs> Didn't even think about yeah, it, really. Nick David. Uh, yeah, can't book. keep a straight face. You can see when he's got some good cards. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find playing like other game sports with the boys, they exhibit different traits to when they're on the rugby pitch? There's some guys who are... Uh, more laid back on the rugby pitch that are super competitive when you're playing cards or something like that? Or does it tend to be that people are pretty much the same? Boys? I'd say people are pretty much the same. <laughs> 90% of us are so competitive and want to win. I think we've had some heated games of cards over the years, but yeah. obviously that's that's who we are. It's ingrained in us to want to win. So I think that's always a good thing when you've got people that are like, ah, oh, don't really care. Everyone's almost a bit like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> What's this? <laughs> Where's your drive? Yeah, but no, it's... There's definitely a competitive edge to most of us. Uh, well, I should hope so. That was, yeah. uh, that was sort of a leading question. If you were like, no, no one really cares. I'd be like, yeah. that's not what we're looking for. Um, so, okay, so look, going back to your career, you've, you've won the Pro and you've got that high, but you're still very young, kind of learning your trade still at, at the senior level. Fast forward to now, where you talked about at the start, like you see yourself and want to kind of be stepping into more of a leadership role with this group at, at Quinns, and you, and you are, and you are kind of filling those shoes. What's that journey look like in those intervening years then for you and how you've kind of gone, hmm, where do I fit in here? How do I carve that space out for me? Um, for me, it's all about earning respect of your peers, earning the trust of your peers to then become the leader. Yeah. I don't think you can come into an environment and force and bully your way in. You have, Everyone has to feel and get a feel for the group and earn people's respect in different ways. And then you can build up that way. But the club have been really helpful. I mean, I remember when I was about 20, 21, 22, they'd start integrating me into what we call the leadership group. Wow. So they'd bring me in for a few weeks if it's, say, a Prem Cup week and I'd be a big voice in those weeks, which I think just drip feeding that in has helped me massively rather than just throw me in the deep end with yeah, the likes yeah. of Dee Smarl and Dommers all in those meetings. I think the fact that I was just drip fed in has, has helped. And then trying to develop my off-field stuff, I've done a few, trying to do a few little courses around my leadership, around body language and how you hold a room and that kind of thing. So I think it's important at the end of training to have everyone's attention get everyone's eyes and that and the better you can come across to the group yeah. like even if your messaging isn't isn't what people agree with they'll still feel empowered and they'll still want to follow you in so i think that's something big into my game interesting and do you feel then that quinn's is is well equipped for that 
there's always that transition in leadership groups, right? Mm-hmm. Whether people like, you know, Danny or whoever, you know, they, whether they want to hear it or not, like they are coming to that mm-hmm. end stage of their career. So it's then what the next step looks like. I imagine you're thinking, well, actually, how can people like you, like Marcus, give the coaches a really difficult decision? Do they need to bring in leaders or actually do they have those guys they can develop in, in the squad? Are you kind of looking further ahead to almost the next two, three, four years where you're like, actually, that's when I'll be in those kind of senior shoes in the, in the Yeah, definitely, I think. And you want to learn off these guys. You want mm. to be able to be in those meetings so I can learn because Danny, Joe, when whenever Joe Launchbury coming in now as yeah. well, is a great speaker in training and he's always got, you can see all the boys are listening in and he doesn't have the biggest voice. He's not the biggest presence, but everyone listens in yeah. when he speaks. So just learning off them and asking them questions on like game management, all of that. And why, why do you say that when when you do and that kind of thing is, is quite fascinating to me yeah so yeah trying to learn off them and then yeah it is for the future hopefully in a couple of years it will be the likes of me marcus domers who yeah. are leading that team so yeah it's definitely something i want to improve on well and you talked about kind of leadership and owning the right and some of that comes through or a big chunk of that actually comes through your performances on the pitch mm-hmm. as well as what you're doing kind of monday through friday in the week and last season top try scorer in the league obviously didn't end the way we wanted it to as mm. as harlequins but do you take immense individual pride in that actually you executed a lot of areas in your game that you've been working on and, and slowly improving to get to that level and the next step is the team also being at that level with you yeah definitely i think it's that it's that respect thing if people see you mm. working hard and like being one of the last out on the pitch doing your extras and it translates into the game i think they'll be like wow Firstly, they want to do it. And yeah. secondly, they'll have my respect when I'm on the pitch and listening to me at the end of meetings. Whereas if you're someone who kind of shirks away from all of that, I don't I think they'll be like, but I've been doing more than why are you yeah, yeah, how yeah. come you're the one talking? So I think, yeah, that's definitely something that's that's massive on the rugby pitch. And then this season at Quinn's, you know, there's been a slight evolution rather than revolution of the, the coaching setup and kind of what that means with Danny Wilson coming in. How has how has he been for the group, but also for you personally? How have you found having a different voice? I imagine for you, you know, you had your dad for that really extended mm-hmm. period of time as the main coaching voice. The coaches at Quinns are admittedly excellent, but sometimes you need that that yeah. freshening up. Do you find that you look out for that that different voice and want to hear something else? Yeah, it's, it's obviously refreshing. And I think I've said it quite a few times in talks I've done recently, but Danny's brought that edge. Mm. I think he's got that bite about him. He can... He can flip and lose it. And I think I've, I've spoken to a few of the new Cardiff boys, Jared and Dylan, and they were obviously coached by him. And yeah. they'd said, watch out for him, because I think we've seen the nice side of Danny so <laughs> far. So um, hopefully we'll never see the bad side of him. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely put boys on edges. You'll see in meetings, he'll be calling people out. And I think that's another, if you can hold a room and keep people attentive to what he's saying and boys are listening, they've got their notepads out now. And I think he's such a stickler for his detail. Yeah. He could ask any one of the 50 man squad in a meeting what's the answer to this question so you've got to be on your toes and yeah. um you can see it out on the pitch boys know their roles there's no there's not as many mistakes and that's all because of what he's driving wow so that's uh must be a strange thing in in sport that actually or particularly at Queens, you keep the group of players together for an extended period of time mm-hmm. like we've had you know a huge amount of re-signings of boys committing their future to, yeah. to the club which is awesome but ultimately, you know, you've mentioned it with the run to the final with Paul Gustard, his way of playing, and then suddenly that changes halfway mm. through the year. Danny comes in at the start of this season. You've also got to be adaptable to what yeah. what the coach wants. Do you ever find yourself as a player thinking, right, I know that I, if left my own devices, would maybe do something in this way, but I know the coach is going to prefer it in this mm. way, so I need to modify how I'm trading or how I'm playing. Well, I think this is where Quinns are so good. The player-coach relationship is so good. Mm. So Steph and Danny are always aligned. They always have meetings to to go through stuff like that so you don't get that situation. Because I right. want to be playing the way I want to play. I want to show what I can do yeah. and what I think my best traits are. I don't want to be having to to, if, to try and prove something else to, mm. to the coach. So I think <clears throat> to be able to have those discussions is key in an environment like this. I think we always talk, we always talk about that player-coach relationship and... To have that at Quinns, I think when we won the league, I'd almost say players were leading it almost more than the coaches. But yeah. with Danny coming in, it's given us that really nice balance where he's open to talking, but he's also got his own opinion. So there's a really nice balance in the group at the moment. And then go back to something you said earlier, that change in going into England camp. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to kind of forensically dissect <laughs> that those two different environments. But with some of that, you said suddenly you were the rookie again, right? Mm-hmm. You're almost going back to being that 18-year-old kid coming in and being like, yeah. wow, what, 
what's this environment? What happens here? Was that enjoyable or was that quite intense at the very, very beginning and quite stressful? It was just different to start, obviously. Right. Like I said, it's been five years since that was me. So yeah. um, I really wanted to, like my biggest thing is earn the respect of others. So mm. go about, ask them questions, find out what they want. They're the ones with 70, 80, 90, over 100 caps, some of them. So yeah. I wanted to learn off them, earn them respect, but also show what I can do. Mm. So then they can respect me as well. So I like to think I was one of the hardest workers, that kind of thing, and tried to prove it that way. So that's what I basically went in with the mindset of doing. And then hopefully if I get selected anymore, then I can start to be, and they'll respect me as well. So I can go back and challenge them yeah. as well. And it's just a healthy environment. That's interesting <clears throat> to hear you talk about kind of wanting to build that that respect to allow you mm. to then have that two-way dialogue. I think that's maybe, I don't know, maybe surprising for some people to hear that actually that's how the player-coach relationship mm. works at its at its best. For you personally, though, how was that feeling of not making that World Cup squad? Was that something that you had kind of had signposted to you in advance or did it still kind of come across as like a, ah? Oh, that close yeah it was it was frustrating mm. it was tough to take but i look back at it, everything happens for a reason i mean i'm still young enough that hopefully i've got another couple of world cup cycles yeah. in me so i don't look at it and it's like oh god that's my one and my chance done i'm looking at it as fine i wasn't ready then i've been giving my stuff to work on <clears throat> i'll go away put my head down i'll work it again and hopefully prove that i can do what what um steve wants me and yeah hopefully get into the into the six nations squad and build from there and is that, is that how it works? I like, excuse the, maybe the, the daft question that the England coaching group will give you kind of specific work on to go, right, we obviously love and rate what you're doing because you're in the, the wider group. But in order to come into our group the way we want it to be done, this is what we need to see from you. How does that align with what Danny and the coaches want here? It's all, they're all pretty aligned. I think obviously okay. Danny worked with Steve as well at yeah. Leicester. So they're all very aligned. And I think it's all about, each player has their X factor and you want to see as much of that as you can. And for right. me, it would probably be getting my hands on the ball, beating that first man in contact. So Steve wants me to see me to get my hands on the ball more so I can prove to him that I can do it nine, 10, 11 times a game rather than just four or five. So it's going looking for that work. And then there are obviously more technical aspects that I want need to work on to try and make my weaknesses almost not so much that. So I've got my kicking, my skills, my aerial skills. And I think a lot of that's down to probably being a forward until I was 16. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I was, and that's what I'd say to all young kids out there, play every position you can. Okay, so although I've now, I'd say I've got this breakdown -y contact. Yeah. I wish I had played a bit more in the backs and I was a lot younger because then I could have developed my kicking game and it's always easy when you're younger to pick up skills like that. So Same as German, German yeah, kicking game. Exactly. That's the advice to kids, <laughs> learn German, improve your kicking game. Oh, but that's interesting though, that that's that you've kind of almost self-diagnosed that, going, mm -hmm. okay, actually I played flanker for so long that mm -hmm. actually I don't have the same skills background as someone who's been playing yeah. back three since they were eight years old. Mm -hmm. How do you improve that? I, that's, I'm just curious. Like, time. What, is it just time? Just time work? and reps and going over it as much as I can. I think, yeah, they're five, six years ahead of me in, some, yeah. in terms of how much they've done. So I need to try and catch that up as much as I can. So, yeah, just... Not a crazy amount because then you don't want to risk injuries or from that kind of thing. And but yeah, trying to get as many in as I can. And I guess all, like I remember speaking to Mike Brown once. You said that it was about super strength, but making mm -hmm. sure that your weaknesses were as good as someone else else's yeah. strengths. So like, what's the thing that you're brilliant at? As you said, it's that you've got that forwards appetite for contact and the breakdown work. But if you can get then those other skills exactly to that level, that's how you're going to stand head and shoulders above above the rest. That's daunting but at least there's a plan right? yeah exactly there's a plan and it's all on me basically which is the exciting thing so I, I look at it and I'm the only one that can improve this I've obviously got the help of all the coaches here at Quinns who will back me as well but I'm the only one really who can put in the work and, and get myself there okay and it sort of reminds me of when you said earlier in the conversation about that coach at county level saying <laughs> you're too small or whatever that you've then gone and basically reevaluate your game you're now a top try scoring winger and now you've got the head of the international rugby coach you know steve saying you're there but we think we can get you to here yeah. and then you'll be playing for for england and you're like a bit between teeth like yeah yeah i'm gonna show you mm -hmm. definitely nice okay so then as we look then forward like past kind of where we're at now you've made 60 70 80 caps for england in the future you're quinn's captain life is life is good but what 
outside of rugby are you looking to kind of supplement that rugby playing life with? You've got other passions outside of outside of rugby that you fill your, your free time with. Yeah, so for me, I'm so unsure about what I want to go into. I'm, I've been speaking, we've got a great um, assistant here at Harlequins who helps you with your career and she's trying to guide you in the right direction. So I'm focusing more on, like I said earlier, my skills. Yeah. So that this public speaking, how to hold a room, um, how to engage one-on-one with people, that kind of, just trying to develop those kind of skills. And hopefully as I do a bit more work experience, as I try and get my head around which path I'm going to take, hopefully one just strikes me and I can grasp it because I've got these skills behind me rather than going, right, I don't really know what I do, but I think it's down this route and back trying to do a degree in X and then ended up actually, I finished my career, I want to go down Y. Whereas if I try and, build up my base I can then choose that later in my career so I'm hoping I've still got a, men- a few more years in me but that's what I'm looking just over the next couple of years short term that's what I'll do but it's interesting that's probably not vastly different to what you were just saying about your rugby about getting that breadth of experience now while you can so it's no different to doing the forward work the backs work the kicking drills the high ball whatever is the same as now you're like you don't have to pick a career exactly right now but what skills can you get that are going to be transferable and I guess it's probably not unique in rugby, but very different in rugby compared to other sports. This idea that you're going to have a second career. Was was the yeah. military ever something that appealed to you with your dad's background? Never. <laughs> I, I always joke about it and say, I've already done 18 years in the military. Why would I want to do any more? I think a lot of military kids either go, right, I want to follow in the yeah. footsteps and really want, or they go the other way and be like, right, I've done that. Been that. And I, I am glad that my dad was like he was when I was younger. I've, I like yeah. to say, I've got like bit of resilience good discipline that kind of thing and i think a lot of the boys would would back me and say the same but also there were days where on a sunday morning i'm hung over when i'm <laughs> after a party or something and all i want to do is just lie in and he'd be in getting me up at the crack of dawn and that kind of thing just to try and prove a point so um but yeah it's always something that i've looked back on but never wanted to do never wanted to do fine so with the public speaking do you think a career in tv beckons you're not are you looking to be the next danny care going on you know itv's musical show or whatever it is <laughs> i'm not sure that's very me but <laughs> i've always liked engaging with people like i said i'm quite extroverts yeah, yeah. i like my socializing so I, I don't think i could sit behind a desk i'd want to do something up and interactive and doing things with people i love my coaching yeah i've done a bit um down at old rigations in the last couple of seasons but now I'm trying to look on to move on to a different club. That was a bit bit far from Guildford to travel. But um yeah. yeah, so I've always wanted to go down that kind of route, maybe not to the top level, but again, it's just getting out myself out there and interacting with people is just something I, I like enjoy doing. Yeah, that, that feels like a common a common theme yeah, sort definitely. of this is is being around people and getting mm-hmm. game fired up from that. So then outside of rugby, we talked about, you know, not necessarily hundred percent certain on exactly what that end goal is, but kind of building those skills up. But what are your what are your extravagances? What are the things that away from rugby are like, that's what, maybe it's a bit, it's a bit much, but that's what I spend my money on. That's what I spend my time doing. Is it, you said food, drink, but they're like yeah. physical things. Are, you, are you awful for shoes or hats? Yeah, or that is one thing really? I reckon. Yeah, Jordans and Dunks, I've got, I reckon I've got four or five pairs of each. So I just, lo- I just love my shoes. Um, right. I'm trying to build, well, I'm planning an extension on my house currently. Wow. Recently purchased the house, so that's... Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's given me some insight into... <laughs> Buy, yeah. Buying a house is uh, is like nothing else when, when, the when paper, you do it. I, yeah, my mum has got me through it because <laughs> without it, I don't think I'd be a property owner right now. I think, yeah, all the solicitors and stuff, but she's helped me through that. And now I'm trying to save and put money away towards hopefully building an extension on the side of my house and making it a proper... A proper bachelor pad. <laughs> a proper bachelor pad. X. I was going to say, not making it into a you know functioning family home. You're like, no, it's the extension. No, I want going a pool table. Right. I want darts board. Yeah, yeah. that's what I've got in my head so far. That's exciting. That's exciting to have as a project outside of outside of rugby. Something that will be be kind of ticking along. Have you been tapping uh, tapping up any of the boys? I know Danny's done a lot of work to his house. Is, has he just said, don't do it? <laughs> I think. If, yeah, I have. Well, I've spoken to him about his build, and I think I tried to almost avoid talking to him because of his experiences. <laughs> I think it would have put me off it. But um, yeah, I've, I've actually found it really interesting. Again, speaking to loads of different architects, finding out different things you can do. Yeah. I'm going to try and. Well, again with my mum's help because she's she was the one that pushed me to buy this house because it had a lot of 
resale value if I did more to it. So right, okay. I think we're going to try and project manage it together. Cool. Get all the stuff in. I think it, it's nice because I don't see her too much. Obviously, I haven't moved out. So yeah. nice to keep us close. So we're going to try and do that together. Oh, brilliant. That's, mm. that's, that's a fun project. But I imagine, what would you rather, would you rather be coached by your dad playing rugby <laughs> or project manage with your mum doing a house renovation? I'm not sure. Uh, which well, one I'm was. hoping I'll make all the decisions and she can just help me with the paperwork. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, okay, well, let's, that's now committed to camera. <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that Caden's making decisions and mum's doing the paperwork. I just don't feel like that's going to happen. Um, cool. So how does that, like, was that something that was an aspiration for you in terms of owning a home at, at, mm-hmm. at this age and kind of being like, right, need to save, need to be smart to kind of get onto the ladder at this point? Or again, was that something that sort of presented itself an opportunity and you, and you grabbed it? No, it's always something I've definitely wanted to do. I think I lived and rented off Marcus for a long time, but I wanted to put my, my money into something of, yeah. of my own. So yeah, as soon as I could, I wanted to grasp the opportunity. And then it was looking a bit more long-term. It was, do yeah. I buy something that's probably going to stick around the same value or do I try and add value myself and yeah. chat into my mum and dad and they think it's a good time to try and do that. So yeah, um, I've got a lot of free time on my hands and that's probably what a lot of it's going to be going towards at the moment. Knocking down a garage is the first start. That sounds exciting. So, yeah, that sounds exciting. manual labour, I think that will, <laughs> that will humble me a bit. So yeah, no, it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to. And Marcus Smith, the landlord, good or bad? Good. Good landlord. Good Excellent. landlord, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed living with him. He was nice, easy. Um, yeah, it was it was good times. Cool. Um, well, that's an exciting. Good luck with that project. Thank you very much. Uh, come back on at some point in the future and with a few more grey yeah, hairs and tell us how it actually went. I'll give a guide to all the mistakes I made. Yeah. So you can, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a separate series <laughs> yeah. that we're working on. Um, and then, like looking at your career so far, there's a few bits that have kind of jumped out that you said. But what would you say, if any, has been the biggest kind of individual hurdle that you've had to overcome to kind of get to where you're at right now? Um, obviously that rejection at a young age was, mm. was pr- the, honestly sticks out with me a lot um, and then I think all my injuries at the start I had yeah. quite a torrid time over the first I think it was three seasons I had some pretty it was just all annoying kind of lengths all around that eight to ten weeks where you mm. s- you get a run of five or six games and then you're set back again and then you've got to work your way back in and but I think finding my own routine, getting to know my body, yeah. getting to know what works for me was definitely almost that maturing stage for me was yeah. trying to find out yeah, what recovery I needed to do, what prep I needed to do to make sure I could back up these games. And I think it showed in the last couple of years when I do get a run of games, I do find my form and I can mm-hmm. produce, but it's just still trying to, I'm still tinkering and altering with that. I don't think I've found the perfect routine yet. And right learning off experience heads in England I think the likes of like Johnny May and all of yeah, them yeah. they have if you ever listen to anything from him he has such specific routines on his stretching and everything like that and just trying to tinker and find what works for me you mentioned routines quite a few times is that something that you find like great comfort in and almost being like right I know like in the morning this is my stretching mm-hmm. routine when I'm in the building this is the routine that I'm going to does that help you kind of empty your mind of the other stuff to focus on what you're doing in that moment? yeah in the workplace or when I've got stuff to do I'll um very much a visual write write it down right otherwise i could just drift through a day and not do anything i think <laughs> okay. if i've got it in front of me i can i know what i need to do like i said with my gym i know what i've got to get done yeah. whereas if i'm they're like oh we're not really sure what i want to do i'll get into it i'll be flat when i'm into it i can't prep myself before right. that kind of thing so as long as i've got a list and i can see what i've done tick them off almost it helps me okay interesting is that come from anyone is that from your parents or is that something you've kind of worked out through yourself through watching times where you've gone Poor, I didn't do anything today. I didn't. I didn't really feel. Much yeah, I think it's or. more. When I was younger, I'd just float through my off days and get not, and I get to the end of it, but oh god, I've done nothing again. I think yeah. I just. <laughs> you hear all these different tips and tricks, for people. It would definitely be something my dad does the military way of. Yeah, I was going to say they have to do things or things don't work. So, I probably saw him do it when I was younger. And I thought, right, I'll give it a go myself. And ever since then, it's worked for me. So I'll keep on doing it. And have you got any other like? passions then outside of rugby and you talked about obviously the, the home project is there anything that you like what do you to unwind when you're when you're sat at home i like my ex but i like playing a bit of fifa okay a um, bit of fifa a bit of call of duty that kind of thing we've got quite a there's loads of boys actually that play it so we've oh, got really? quite a good group there's always someone on to and again it's that socializing thing yeah, I think. yeah i was gonna say yeah. um i'm not i can't really binge a series that much unless i'm proper invested in it right okay um but yeah, I'd say, I'd, again, still, it's Xbox and chatting to people. Xbox, chatting to people. Mm. 
Where are you ranking? Who's the best FIFA player in the in the squad? Oh, FIFA, I'm not sure. Me and Marcus always have a... Dom has liked to think he's up at our level, but... You keep him. You're yeah. sort of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, no. but uh, yeah, me and Marcus always had a nice little tussle in the house. <laughs> We've, who's cooking dinner? We play like a best of three kind of Ooh. or an aggregate kind of game and they're always pretty intense. But no, that's yeah, good. Who's... When you did live together then, who's, who was the chef in the house? Was that whoever lost at FIFA? Who, or would you sort of be like... I hope Marcus loses because he's really good at cooking. <laughs> no, not every night. I think we both had different... He brought a lot of his mum's cooking from the foot, which was unbelievable. Really? Like, but I think he'd only bring that out on some occasions because it took a bit longer. But honestly, when he did it, they were incredible. All his rice dishes and stuff like that were were brilliant. Whereas I'd say I was probably... I, I like my cooking. I'd yeah. say I probably like it more now I'm living on my own. Yeah. Right. You don't have to cater. I live with Jack Musk and George Hammond and trying to cook for boys that size that much i felt like i was cooking for the whole squad almost it was so so much but yeah I, I've, I've enjoyed my cooking but it's definitely more simpler dishes it's interesting when you speak to speak to you and speak to a few of the boys that how many of you guys all like at various times have lived with each mm. other and kind of share houses together i i wonder like how many other people in their in their work in their professions would want to live with people they work with every day is that another testament to this group that actually you've all kind of be in each other's pockets in the best sort of way. Mm -hmm. So you're more willing to go out there and put your body where it hurts for each other. Yeah, definitely. I think we've got such a great group of boys in our squad and we're all so, so friendly. And I think a lot of us have come through the academy as well. Mm -hmm. You look at the boys on the pitch now or we've all known each other. So like Will Porter and Nick David, I played with them at England under 18s and went on tour to South Africa with them. Yeah. So like we all kind of know each other. We've all been around the same group. So yeah, we're all pretty comfortable in each other's space. Um, so yeah, I think that's why a lot of boys live together. Interesting. Right, uh, look, it's been a fascinating chat. We've covered mm -hmm. a lot of ground so far. So uh, I'll kind of draw it to a close with my last question, which uh, there's a different one for this this series than we did in the first series. It's when you look back on your career, okay, let's again, imagine ourselves in the future, long time still to come, but you're hanging your boots up. What do you want your proudest memory to be of your rugby career? Um... There are a lot of almost tangible things that I could say, but for me, it would just so I can be at one with myself would be I want to know I've like given it my all. Mm. I think that that is the biggest thing for me. If I think I've cut corners or I didn't quite give it my all at that stage or I wasn't really focused then, I think that would be something that I probably would struggle to live with, no matter how well or how how not well I did. I think I just want to know that I've given it my all. And is that something that you almost check in with yourself on regularly at the end of the day, start of the day? Have I, have I, done, have I done myself proud before I worry about anyone else? Yeah, definitely. And there are ups and downs that mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm superhuman and I'm right at the height every, every day, but to try and just keep myself moving forward and deal with setbacks and frustrations, that's something that I just try and, yeah, get... Um, get comfortable with is knowing what days I can push and what days to just almost hold back on. Excellent. Well, Caden, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to speak to us. Uh, fascinating chat and uh, best of luck for the rest of the season. Thank you very much.